So before I invite David forward, I'll, I'll read the passage first, David, that's right. And uh, David will say something about uh, his personal and professional life, as, as always. Thank you, David. Look forward to that. Um, to very important work that David is doing professionally uh, in relation to the uh, assisted dying um, bill, I think, uh, which is going to come forward again. So do, do listen well to that. But let's begin in Luke 18. 1 to 8, page 1051 to 1052, in the Blue Church Bible. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about, sorry, nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Great pleasure to have David with us again. Uh, the, uh, you um, no doubt remember from previous years, David comes around this time of year to help us uh, in the summer months. And uh, oh, great pleasure. Most welcome, David. Thank you so much, Dr. David Randall. Thank you. Well, uh, hello, everyone. And thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a real privilege to come. I look forward to coming each year. That doesn't mean you have to keep inviting me back. That's entirely your choice. Um, but uh, no, it's lovely, uh, lovely to come and be here. Um, I, uh, with my wife, and we've got four kids. We're at um, Poplar Baptist Church, which is just probably not half, about half a mile, I guess, down the down the main road that way. Um, similar number of us to you, I guess, uh, looking round. Um, and uh, yeah, the Lord's good. He, he blesses us. Um, I, I work as a doctor. I work at the Royal London Hospital. You probably uh, know it in Whitechapel. Um, I look after people with kidney disease um, there, and dialysis patients and transplant patients. Um, Ollie asked me just to mention a little bit about some of the other stuff I, I, I do. Um, I, I'm involved with a bunch of kind of Christian doctors and also some non-Christian doctors um, in, in opposing a change in the law to allow assisted suicide and euthanasia. Um, and it's something I've done for a, a number of years um, and continues to take a lot of time <laughs> and effort. Um, I, I think we're at quite a critical moment in that debate. Um, there's an active bill was introduced to Parliament last week. Um, it all goes quiet over the summer, but then from October and November it's going to be right in the news and, and being discussed in Parliament. Um, and from a human perspective, I don't think it's unrealistic to say that within a year the law might have changed to allow doctors to kill patients coming towards the end of their lives. Um, there's a lot of public support for that. There's some people with very good intentions tr arguing for this, but I, I do believe it is. I know from the Bible that that's wrong, that we don't kill people. Um, but also it's the consequences that would have for some of the weakest and most vulnerable people in society, for how it would change the whole way we think about illness, that suddenly people start to feel they're a burden and that people like them should really be asking for this and it, it would totally transform really the way we provide medicine, the way we look after disabled people um, and there, there, there are just so many good reasons that we shouldn't go down that route. Um, but it feels a bit like we're fighting against the tide here and, and there's, there's a huge kind of amount of political pressure, lots of new MPs who maybe haven't thought much about this. Um, so yeah, please pray for us <coughs> in our efforts. Um, I'm going to the Labour Party conference in September to man a stall 
um, on this and then we've got various attempts to meet with MPs and arrange meetings and this kind of stuff, write stuff in the press, uh, speak on the news and so on. So we're, we're, we're trying to be as active as we can but please pray for us um, as we do this. It's, it's quite, hard, quite hard work actually so yeah please do pray um, and pray in his mercy that God would keep us away from, from going down this route. In Canada and some other places where they have legalised this it really has been quite devastating the impact. Um, we're just trying to show people that and, and help people see that this would be uh, a, great, uh, a great mistake for our country. Um, anyway, um, let's, uh, let's get on. Let's look at God's word. Um, shall I just pray? This is a passage about prayer, isn't it? Shall I, shall I pray that the Lord will help us understand it? Father God, we thank you that when we meet together as Christians, <clears throat> you're here with us and your Holy Spirit is in the room uh, and he indwells those of us who are believers and he speaks to us, those of us who are not. Uh, and through him and through your word in the Bible, we, f we hear you speaking to us, words of truth, words we can rely on, words we can build our life on. And Father, I pray now that you'd help us to understand this passage. Uh, I pray that you would speak to each of us and that we would go home understanding more about who you are and your purposes in our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my relatives got into trouble recently for not giving a trigger warning when he said something and someone was upset by what he said. So I'm going to start with a trigger warning that the subject we're looking at today covers some of the most difficult part perhaps of our Christian life and that is the question of unanswered prayer where you really pray and you really want the Lord to do something and you pray and you pray and you pray and you keep praying and you don't get the answer you were looking for. Now that is really hard and that touches some very painful areas in our lives. It's perhaps the greatest stumbling block for some Christians, the greatest challenge we have to our Christian faith. It can leave us feeling rejected. Like you look around the church and other people pray for things and they seem to get what they want and you, you don't. What does that mean? Is God rejecting you as a person? Can leave you feeling angry or hurt? Can leave you feeling envious of others? With a deep longing? Can leave you feeling bitter? There's a character in the Old Testament whose name is Naomi, which means pleasant. And bad things happen to her and she changes her name to Mara, which means bitter. And maybe there's something of that in you that you've longing for something and you've prayed and prayed and God hasn't answered and you feel a bit angry, you feel a bit bitter about this. Perhaps there's prayers that we no longer pray. Think perhaps about a family member. You would really love to see them come to know Jesus and you've prayed and you've prayed for many years and actually now maybe you don't pray those prayers anymore because they don't seem to be answered. Or maybe you do pray them, but you don't pray them with much, much intensity or much belief. Perhaps you have a deep feeling of pain in your heart. You feel that God doesn't care. Maybe you feel judged that you haven't got enough faith, that you're not a good enough Christian. We'll just hold on to those thoughts as we look at this parable together. I want to say three things about this parable. The first is that the woman coming to the judge has a very reasonable request. She's not asking for anything wrong. She's not being greedy. She's not being unrealistic. She comes with a very reasonable request. This is not a Lamborghini prayer. Lord, I need to get to work. And as I've been thinking about it, what I've decided I really need is a very fast car so I can get there quicker. This is not a George Clooney prayer that I'm single and I would love to have a partner and as I've been thinking about it, this is the kind of man I need. It's not even a daily bread prayer. You know, Lord, I need stuff to, to eat to go about my business, help my child fit in at school, uh, help so-and-so in the church who's ill. This is a righteous and a godly prayer. This woman, okay, she suffered personal injustice. But caring about justice in the world, caring about 
righteousness and decisions are made are right after God's own heart. When this widow is crying out for justice against the horrible person who's treating her badly, she is very close to God's own heart here. God is described in the Old Testament as a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. It's God in his holy dwelling. This is something God passionately cares about, justice. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching some of the Olympic coverage, but you may have seen some of the adverts that come on the BBC. And one of them, which I just saw yesterday, is an advert for a, a series on BBC Four about American foreign politics. And it begins with this quote of someone saying, in the world you can either have peace or justice. That's what he says. You can either have peace or justice. And he's applying it to these to these uh, foreign policy situations. You know, you leave some dictator in power, there's no justice, but there's peace. You overturn that dictator, you get justice, he pays for his crimes, but there's chaos. You can either have peace or justice. And it feels, it's perhaps a bit of a cynical way of putting it, but it feels that there's always this, this trade-off. The justice, the, the, the judge here just goes for peace. He doesn't care about justice. But God cares about both, doesn't he? He cares about peace on earth, and he cares about justice. And it feels impossible sometimes for us to marry these things up. And so we end up in these compromised situations. <clears throat> so this woman is coming and saying, grant me justice. And the judge does not care. She comes with a very reasonable request. I don't know if you've seen a film that came out a few years ago called Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Has anyone seen that film? It's a very good film. It's a very shocking film, actually, if you've, if you, if you've watched it. But it's the story of this woman in America whose, whose daughter has been abused and murdered and the police department just don't care. They don't investigate it. And so she, what she does, she's angry, she's bitter, she's frustrated. She hires three billboards on the way into the town and she puts up these phrases, raped whilst dying, still no arrests, what's going on, Judge Willoughby? And she puts these things as you drive into the town you see these billboards and it's a fantastic film actually about how that all plays out and her her desire for justice and, and what eventually ends up happening but this desire for justice for right things to be done is something we should feel as Christians we should burn that there's justice on earth we should be ready to challenge and ready to ask and we should be bringing these requests to our Heavenly Father as this woman does to this judge who doesn't care couldn't care less we should care about the way our world functions. So there's nothing wrong with what the woman is asking here. And yet the answer she gets is no for a very long time. A reasonable request. The second thing I want to show you is, and I use the term cautiously here, an annoying woman. This is what the judge would be thinking, right? So the the video there of that Australian video. This is a really annoying woman who just won't go away. Um, I, was, uh, I was speaking on this to a, a kid's camp last year on this parable and I got someone in the audience to keep phoning me. I had my volume turned up to loud so I kept trying, they didn't realise I was around, I kept trying to give the talk and then my phone would go and I pretended it was someone at work and I kept saying, look, just go away, I'll sort this out later. And they kept ringing me and kept ringing me finally. I said, look, just go away, I'll sort it out now. Um, but you get the point. If you're, from the judge's perspective, this is just an irritation. It's an irritation in his life. And this woman is really annoying and becomes more and more annoying as the parable goes on. Finally, she's answered. Even more than annoying, she becomes threatening, doesn't he? Might, eventually this woman will, will wear me out, he says. Eventually she'll come and attack me. A question for you. Are you annoying... To God. Is God annoyed with you? Do you keep bothering God? Or does God, is God rarely troubled by you? You rarely give him much reason uh, to be annoyed. Now obviously God is not annoyed by us and I need to say that really carefully. I use the word advisedly. But do you bother God? People sometimes say that about Christians, don't they? They say they're God botherers. But I, I worry about myself that I don't bother God nearly as much as I should. There can be two responses to the trouble we get in life, difficult situations we face. 
all too often I am very independent that's the way I tend to be set up and I've got some issue and I'm, my mind is immediately turning and I'm making plans and I'm thinking I could do this I could put this plan in place I could speak to this person so and so would help me uh, and it can go a very long time before I even think to pray about the issues I have in life all too often I'm independent and I'm sorting my own problems out we are functionally godless I believe in God in my mind but actually my problems day to day I sort out myself Jesus said pray for your daily bread do you do that? I just think well of course I've got daily bread I go to work I've got money I go to the shop I get my bread what's that got to do with God? there's another response which maybe we do is we feel terrified and we feel all stressed and we don't know what to do when we face these problems and we go to all other people and we bring our problems to lots of other other people we're very dependent on others perhaps other people say we're needy you ever been called needy always expressing your problems to other people and other people feel fed up with you because they can't answer those uh, problems we're clingy maybe or, or moany or we're always bringing our issues to others rather than taking them to God God is a lo God who loves to be bothered when Jesus taught his disciples to pray he said when you pray you start off by praying to the Lord and we say give us today our daily bread sometimes I'm tempted to say to God look could we just set up some kind of monthly direct debit system where I have enough stuff and I'll, I'll ask you once a month for all the things I might need that's the way I do my shopping at home you know I you know we have we have a van arrives and crates of food come into our house and we fill up our fridge and our freezer and then we don't have to go to the shops for the next I don't know seven days or ten days or whatever it is maybe that's how you run your life as well Jesus says we should be asking for our daily bread and he's basing that of course on the Israelites in the desert who had to go out every day and pick up manna and if they picked up too much manna if they picked up a two-day supply the next day it was filled with maggots and it was rotten because they had to learn that every day God was going to provide for them perhaps there's a an analogy here with children I want my children to be dependent on me it's right and proper that they should learn to trust me and that's part of the process of being a child you learn to trust your parents some of us have uh, had difficult upbringings and we that, that was difficult and it was disrupted and we didn't learn to trust our parents because our parents weren't trustworthy but actually for a child to grow up they need to learn to trust their parents and to come every day and again would it be any good for a child if if if, if mum or dad said oh don't worry there's a, a whole series of, of, of dinners available you just pop them in the microwave you'll be fine is that a good way to bring up a child? No. It's good for the child every day to come in and say, Mom, what's for dinner? Fish and chips, great. And they learn that each day they're going to be provided for. The project, you see, is us. And we need to learn to trust. We need to learn to come to God every day and ask Him for what we need. And I'm really bad at doing that. And maybe you are as well. I'm much too independent in my life. And if I can't solve my old problems, I go to others around me and ask them to sort my problems and I need to train myself to be asking my Heavenly Father every day God is a love who God who loves to be bothered and as Christians we need to learn to be much more annoying we need to be much more like this woman who would not leave the judge alone until she got what she needed that's what we need to train ourselves to be like and then the third thing I want to, to draw to your attention is the silence that she gets silence which feels like a rejection and it was shown quite nicely in that video wasn't it she comes she looks hopefully through the door slam slam comes the door perhaps you've been praying for something for a very very long time that is right good and you've learned some of these lessons about annoying God and every day you do go and you say to God look I'm still praying to you about this I still want this to happen please answer my prayers and day after day week after week year after year decade after decade 
nothing seems to change. Nothing seems to alter in the heart of that child you've been praying for since they were a little baby. And still they just seem indifferent and apathetic and they don't seem to want to know the Lord. Perhaps it's an elderly parent, perhaps it's a situation, perhaps it's a whole country, perhaps there's some, some big issue personally in your life. And you keep bringing this to the Lord and the answer either seems to be no or just nothing. It's like you're standing and shouting out into space and nothing comes back. It's very interesting that Jesus specifically tells us that this judge is a bad one. He does it twice. He tells us in verse 2 that this judge neither fears God nor cares what people thought. And then just in case you missed that, it's reinforced in the words of the judge himself. Verse 4, even though I don't fear God or care what people think. He's got a swagger, he's got a disdain. He really couldn't be bothered, this judge. So we're told twice that the point is reinforced. This is a bad judge. Why does Jesus liken our loving Heavenly Father to this terrible man that pops up in this story? Why doesn't Jesus just say, look, there was a busy judge. Got loads and loads of cases and this, this woman's one had dropped down because, you know, and he just needed to wait until he got onto her. And then she'll get what she needs. Might be, you know, you might think, oh God, God's got, you know, seven billion people in the world to look after. I'm just one, I just need to wait my turn. That might help us to rationalise what's going on here. Or why didn't he say, this was a wise judge. Who recognised that the woman would be better waiting a few more, few more months and then she'd get justice. And, and, and actually, he understood a lot more than she did. God specifically zeroes in on this guy being horrible. Well, obviously, God is, Jesus is very careful here to separate the judge from God. You'll see that in verse 6 in his response. The Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. So that's a different character. And will not God bring about justice? So God is, is not the judge in this story. Very, very clear. And don't think that our father is like this judge. Don't think he's indifferent or hard-hearted. That that is totally wrong. If you read the Bible, that's a totally false picture of God. So why, do, why, does Jesus in, why does he include this story? Why is it helpful to us? I think it's a very honest part of Scripture. It speaks to our experiences and the frustration we get. And how a bit like Naomi we were talking about before from the Old Testament. How that's how we feel. We feel bitter. We feel sometimes that we're lost and that heaven's against us. Why is the book of Job in the Bible? Poor old Job who loves God and serves him. And yet all these bad things happen repeatedly to him and he's left with nothing. Even his body is covered with sores and his friends all turn against him and he's left totally alone. Why is that story in the Bible? Why doesn't it just kind of smooth things over and we get to the end where everything's all right and everything, everything is fine? Well, the Bible is so realistic about how we are and about how it can feel as a human. It can feel like you're facing enormous forces that don't care about you. That you're just someone facing an impersonal universe and if there's anyone out there anyway, they probably don't care, they're probably hard-hearted. That's how it can feel. And this is how truthful the Bible is. It's very honest to our experiences. It allows us to be honest. There's no idea in the Bible that you just have to paint on some smile when you come to church and... Pretend that everything's easy and nice in your life and all your, all your prayers get answered. The Bible doesn't expect that of us. Very, very honest and very, very realistic about the experiences we face. So we see a reasonable request. This woman brings a very reasonable request to God. She cares about justice. She cares about her circumstances. She expects that there's going to be a moral framework for the universe and she brings that to this judge. Grant me justice. We've seen how she's really annoying and the challenge there about what we're like to God, whether we're bothering God, whether we're troubling him. And then this long silence when for a long time she gets nothing. Until eventually the judge listens. 
and does what she wants. And Jesus says this, Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him night and day? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Quickly. There's a little bit of time there, suddenly. And we remember that God sees things in a very different way from us now. One day, we'll be sitting at the end of eternity and we'll be looking back and we'll get some of God's perspective on timelines. Things that seem to us like they're going on for ages and ages and ages. And that suddenly God, in the vastness of eternity, will see the way God sees these situations. And will perhaps understand this bit of scripture. Because it may not be much comfort to you now, you might think, but I'm stuck in the middle of this and I've been stuck in the middle of this for years. Jesus says, quickly I'll get justice. And it doesn't feel like anything's happened quickly. Think about a child who falls over and their knee is bleeding and it hurts and they go and it's not sorted out quickly and they go to mum and they get a cuddle but it still hurts and it's still bleeding and they have to wait a few more minutes until they get the plaster and the calpol or whatever they need feel just awful and we see that as an adult and we think something a bit endearing isn't there about that child thinking this is going to go on forever and ever and ever and then just a few minutes later they're happy and they're running around again and it's not easy for us to get this into our heads, is it? The, that, that eternal perspective. But what we're going through here is described elsewhere in the Bible as light and momentary troubles. What we're experiencing now won't go on forever. If you're in the middle of something terrible, if it's been going on for many, many years, it won't go on forever. Nothing will go on forever. The only thing that goes on forever is a glorious life with the Lord in eternity. That's the perspective. That's the true perspective. The Lord says, will not God bring about? Will he keep putting them off? And it's hard there not to see Jesus echoing the words of Abraham uh, back in Genesis 18 when God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says to him, will not the judge of all the earth do right? And here we've got a story about a judge, haven't we? And I'm sure Jesus would have had this twirling in his mind as he told this story. Abraham goes to God and says, won't the judge of all the earth do right? A bit like that woman. Aren't you going to do right here, God? You say you're going to destroy the whole of Sodom and Gomorrah, and yet there's good people living there. Won't you do right? And God enters into discussion with Abraham. And the answer is, very definitely in Scripture, that yes, the judge of all the earth will do right. There will be no eventual trade-off between peace and justice. Uh, and actually, the judge is just going to you know, ignore the injustice because he wants peace. That's not the case. The judge of all the earth will do right. God will ensure that his people get justice. If you're praying something right, keep praying it. Because God will make that happen. God will answer. In the end, and I don't understand how that's going to happen, but in the end, all these things will come, will come about. God's will will come about and it will be good. And it will be right and it will be just. And we don't see that and we're frustrated and we want it now. I keep praying those prayers. Because the promise is here. He will see they get justice. And quickly. So if that's your prayer, keep praying it. Jesus introduces in the end, second half of verse 8, two new perspectives with that final sentence. He says, However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So first of all, we've got that idea again about timescales. When the Son of Man comes. When that happens, it is going to happen. It's in the future, but it is going to happen. When he comes, will he find faith? Every story has a beginning, a middle, or an end. All the, all the good ones do, anyway. Some, some kind of child stories. You know, when, when children go to school, they're taught to write stories, aren't they? With a beginning, and a middle, and an end. Some ch children's stories just kind of go on, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then this happened, and then that happened. And it never, never finishes. Good stories have an end. And if you like reading novels, you know, you're sometimes kind of two-thirds or 
three quarters away of your way through a novel and you think how on earth is this ever going to end you've got all these situations you know the character the hero their their life has fallen apart they're facing terrible odds uh, everything's gone wrong and is upended and you think how on earth is this going to work and if it's a really good author then you know those last few chapters suddenly things come back together again and they conclude now obviously human stories some of them have sad or bad endings don't they and, and things are things are lost forever but actually if it's a story with a good ending and uh, if you haven't read the bible if you read to the end it is a good ending so it's a spoil it for you but it's a story with a good ending and, and we're looking kind of three quarters of the way through thinking how on earth is this going to resolve how on earth are all the, the mess my life is in sometimes? I've, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what's going on. I'm facing these terrible things. I've, I've got no money. I've got no hope. I've got insecure. I've got all this stuff is a mess. And you think, how on earth is, is this going to come about? But it is. The universe is going to come to an end where every wrong is righted, where Jesus is Lord, where people who have opposed God will be judged for that where people who faithfully served him will be honored and vindicated and, and welcomed into the Lord's house forever that is going to happen there's that lovely old hymn which says I cannot tell how he will win the nations how he will claim his earthly heritage I cannot tell how he will satisfy the needs and aspirations of East and West of sinner and of, of sage I can't tell that I don't know how it's gonna happen but this I know or flesh will see his glory. This I know, he will claim his earthly heritage. You know, we, we don't have to understand how the Lord's going to do this. We're called just to trust. And we're at that stage, three quarters of the way into the novel, where, you know, we have some idea, we're called to trust on God that he has a plan, but we don't see it, and we're still in that bit where things feel very, very broken, very wrong. But the Son of Man is coming back. And that's the first perspective we need. And the second perspective we need is this question that Jesus leaves us with. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith? Now remember, this is a parable that's given to teach his disciples to pray and not give up. It's actually explained for us. Many of the parables, you don't know why he's taught them necessarily. You have to work it out for yourselves. But this is a parable where, Jesus t where we're told by Luke why he taught it. Verse 1. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And then it finishes by saying, when he comes back, will he find faith on earth? Will he find people who are praying? Or will he find people who are all just running around sorting out their own problems and, and trying to live life as they see fit. Faith is something in our character that leads us to trust God no matter what. It's a change in our character. And actually, it's no exaggeration to say that developing faith is the key objective in the Christian life. Faith is how we're saved. There's no other way to be saved but to put your faith in Jesus. If you're someone here who's not yet crossed the bridge, if you like, if you've not yet made that decision in your heart to trust Jesus, there's no other way to the Father except by trusting in him. It's only as we come to put our faith wholeheartedly in Jesus that we can become a Christian in the first place. And then if you are a Christian, faith is how we live as Christians. It's about weaning ourselves away from the old ways of living, which are about grabbing and demanding and taking and working really hard and, and, and trying to be good enough. It's about losing that way of life and starting a way of life or learning to lead a life, which is all in the light of who God is. It's about seeing God. That's what faith is. Seeing God and trusting him in the daily decisions of life. I'm going on a camp in a few weeks and I'm the speaker on the camp and uh, I, I decided to, um, to, to base our series of stories on Hebrews chapter 11 and if you haven't, if you're not familiar with Hebrews chapter 11 then that's your homework for this week is to read it 
and, and read. And it, it, it has this phrase that runs through the chapter. By faith, so-and-so did this. By faith, so-and-so did this. By faith, so-and-so did this. It goes all the way through the Old Testament, showing the difference that that character has, that character that God wants to forge in us, of faith in Christ. By faith, these people did him did extraordinary things by faith they kept going through terrible persecutions people were thrown into lion's dens or into the fiery furnace not something any of us would choose to have done to us but they trusted and some of them were delivered from those circumstances because they trusted some of them were not delivered so some of them were sawn in two they were stoned to death they faced death by the sword by faith by faith they kept going through these hard and difficult situations where there was not always an easy rescue, easy solution. But they kept going through faith. The great example of that, which the writer of Hebrews 11 dwells on more than anyone else, is Abraham. And Abraham leaves behind his solid brick house in a civilised part of the world because he's told to go to the promised land. And he never again dwells in a building. The rest of his life is lived in tents. However much you like camping, it's, it's not a great way to live for a long period of time in a tent. Hard. He never owns land in the same way. He never owns the land that he lives on. He's living all the time looking forward to the city without foundations whose architect and builder is God. He's living in faith. God said, you'll have this land. He doesn't own it now. He just moves around from campsite to campsite, looking forward to the promises that God made. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith in our hearts? Are we people who, when we hit problems, we go to God and we say, Lord, help me in this situation? Because that's what God wants to build in us. Um, a few years ago, uh, Abigail, my wife, and, and I, <coughs> we adopted a child. Um, and as part of the adoption process, you have to go through lots of training. And it was really, really helpful. I tell you, like, you know, it's worth doing the training, even if you're not going to adopt. It was so helpful learning how to, learning, you know, from, from people who've thought about it a lot, about how to, to help children who come from very difficult situations uh, and how to how to teach them and one of the things that children need to learn is to trust their parents and so they said to us when you have your adopted child take them to the park and encourage them to do the really high climbing frames don't just leave them in the sand pit encourage them to go up on these ones with ladders and, and ropes and all that kind of thing and, and, and encourage them to go to that stage where they suddenly feel really wobbly and nervous because they're really high off the ground but they can't do the next bit and it says do it with them Go on it with them so that they learn. <gasps> I can't cope in life. Oh, don't worry. Mum's there or dad's there because that's what they need to learn. They need to learn to trust. They need to learn that the adults in their lives they can rely on. So far in their lives, they haven't been able to rely on adults. And you need to teach them that they can rely on you because you're their new parents. God wants to teach us. We've been adopted into his family. He wants to teach us that we can rely on him. And so sometimes difficult situations come in our lives. Sometimes they're difficult situations that aren't just solved like that. He wants to teach us to keep relying on him. Keep trusting. So let's go back to that thought with which we began. That question of unanswered prayer. Those things that maybe we've stopped praying about now because we're not sure that prayer is the answer anymore. We've tried that and now we've given up. We sometimes think that that is the biggest issue in our life. I've really been praying for this individual about this situation, about my circumstances, about my illness, whatever it is. That's the biggest thing that I need God to sort. You know, when we see here, will God, will he find faith on earth? We, start, we suddenly see that from God's perspective, what he's trying to do is to teach us to be people of faith. 
And if every prayer was answered like that, do we become people of faith? Or do we become consumers? I solved this problem. Oh yeah, it's a bit like how we are now with Amazon, isn't it? I want something, I ding, 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 and it arrives three hours later, a man with a, with a motorcycle. You know, is that, is that how God wants us to be? God wants us to be people who depend on Him. Who depend on Him through difficult times, through frustrations. It says of those people in the Old Testament, they wandered about, they had no home, they wandered about in animal skins, living in holes in the ground and caves, because they were looking for something better. They were looking for the, the heavenly city that will not disappoint. Jesus told them this parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. God bless you.